Hello and welcome to the online version of Lansdowne Evangelical Free Church's morning message for the 2nd of April 2023. This is our final message on the book of 1 Samuel. I've managed to get there before Easter uh, and also before I go on sabbatical at the end of April. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us before we read, because as you will see when we do read, this is a, a tragic chapter of scripture, and yet it speaks to us today. The desperate situation in this world, in the church, and indeed in many of our lives. God speaks, God's word is relevant to us all. I will just say by way of warning that there are various uh, building works going on around the church building at present, repairs to the roof, and there may be a few crashes in the background um, of, of things being moved around. Hopefully not, but if they are, don't worry, that um, it, it is not a cause for concern. Let's pray that God would help us to focus upon his word. Let's pray. Our Father, you know all things. You know who we all are. You know me. You know every person who watches this video. You know, that, you know them by name. You know where they are. You know what's going on in their lives. Father, thank you that... That means we know that when we come to your word, Lord, it's not just simply a, a random lesson. But Father, you're able to speak directly into each situation in our lives. Things that you would like to talk to us about because you know us. We pray you give us ears to hear. I pray, Father, you'd help me to be faithful to the text of scripture to explain the passage clearly because it's not in my speculation that you speak but it's in your word that you speak so it'll help me to be clear and true to your word so give us ears to hear your voice give us the capacity whatever's going on around us right now to concentrate that we would not uh, as it were, have your voice drowned out by the noise of our surroundings, the noise of our own thoughts and attitudes. But Lord God, that you would speak and you would change us through your word. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let me read to you 1 Samuel chapter 31. Now the Philistines fought against Israel and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons and the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malkishua, the sons of Saul. A battle pressed hard against Saul and the archers found him and he was badly wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armour bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armour bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And when his armour bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. Thus Saul died and his three sons and his armour bearer and all his men on the same day together. When the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those beyond the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled. The next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. And 
So they cut off his head, and stripped off his armour, and sent throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to the house of their idols and to their people. They put his armour in the temple of Ashtaroth, and they fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shan. But when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Beth Shan, and they came to Jabesh and burned them there. And they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jabesh and fasted for seven days. Praise God for his word. Now there's a phrase in English that sometimes people use when they meet someone who's looking sad or worried. The phrase is this, cheer up, it might never happen. In other words, the thing you're worrying about may never happen, so why worry? But what about when the thing you're worry, worrying about does happen? Or when something even worse happens? If you lived in Israel during the time of 1 Samuel 31, the worst has happened. The king that you chose, Israel, all those years ago, to lead you out to fight the Philistines, was dead. Not just dead, but he killed himself. And the enemy has now killed many others and taken many of your towns. And now the enemy is celebrating their victory by giving praise to their false gods while Yahweh appears to be silent. The worst had happened. Yet in this tragic chapter of scripture, perhaps one of the most tragic chapters in the whole of the Bible, God is still sovereign and out of this great tragedy he is preparing a new thing. Now last week in our live service we heard from Kevin Croft from the London City Mission preaching on Romans 8.28 and we need to know that when the worst happens God is still working all things together for good to those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. And nothing has changed. From Romans 28 to 1 Samuel 31 to 2023. In your circumstances, in the circumstances in the United Kingdom and around the world, when the worst still seems to happen, God is still sovereign and God is working his purposes out and God is working all things together for the good of those who love him. The tragic thing about Saul is Saul did not love God. And his life ends in his dreadful defeat and suicide. David did love the Lord and David waited all those years saying that the Lord would deal with Saul and to Samuel which you can read uh, while I'm on sabbatical during um, end of April, May, June, July, August you can read, study that, that for yourself also and see how God does work for David's good Saul is now removed and David the king will soon be taking the throne and ruling not perfectly as 2 Samuel makes very very clear because he's not the Messiah he's not Jesus but ruling well as a good king for God's beloved people. Out of tragedy God is working but let's seek to understand what this passage is telling us because while that's a big picture that God is working even in the midst of tragedy there's also many very sobering deeply challenging lessons for us in 1 Samuel 31. 
And what's going on here? Well, if you've been following our series on 1 Samuel, uh, last time we, we looked at um, chapter 29 and 30, and we saw how uh, David had been sent away by the Philistines. David would, was staying with the Philistines. We find out that in chapter 27. And he's actually got himself into quite a dilemma because the Philistines are going to war against Israel and the king, the king of the Philistines that he's staying with, wants David to go with him. But the other kings and the commanders of the army say no. And David is now out of the situation. He's gone back to the, the city that Achish had given to him. He finds that city, Ziklag, burn with fire. He pursues the, the raiders, the Amalekites, and recovers all. That's chapter 30. But jump a couple of chapters back to chapter 28, and you find Saul inquiring of a medium because he saw the great Philistine army. Saul leaves a medium in chapter 28. The Philistines are setting up their army in chapter 29 and verse 11. It says the Philistines went up to Jezreel. They're moving up towards the north of the country. And in this chapter, chapter 31 and verse 1, we find the battle on Mount Gilboa, in, again in the region of Jezreel, further north uh, in Israel. So the Philistines are coming in to the, to the middle of Israel, cutting off the northern tribes from the southern tribes and engaging in this battle. Now it's important that we realise that David is right down south. Ziklag is right down south. So David is probably four or more days journey away. He was three days journey from Aphek, um, and, but now the Philistines have gone further north. So he's probably three and a half, maybe four days journey away from Saul, who's been fighting this battle on Mount Gilboa in the region of Jezreel. David, in chapter 30, successfully pursues the Amalekites and recovers all. David was victorious in chapter 30. In chapter 31, Saul has failed and Saul is about to die. But it is again, as we've seen with Saul, so many times God gave opportunity for him to show true repentance. Even from his earlier failings, there was no repentance. Even when he began to, to, to see God's hand upon David, there was no repentance. Even when he began to pursue David and God rebuffed him, when he was overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit and stripped naked and prophesied, even then there was no real change of heart. Even when David uh, cut off part of his robe, when David took his spear from his head and didn't kill him, there was no repentance. Even when God permitted Samuel to come back through uh, the, 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 the working of the medium, God overruling evil for good in that situation, that a final word could come from Samuel, or rather a repeat of Samuel's final word to Saul should come. So chapter 15, the, 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 the prophecy that the kingdom was torn away, and then that's repeated in chapter 28, the, the word affirmed. Even then, Saul is terrified. He is sorrowful, but there's no repentance. And on a human level, how things would have been different if at any time Saul had repented and called David back to his side. The victorious David fighting a different enemy, the Amalekites, succeeding. And now Saul, the failed king the people's king, but the king who was head and shoulders, it says, he's taller than any other. He was a fine and handsome man, and yet the people's king could not do God's work because his heart was not submitted to the living God. And he rejected God's chosen king, David, and now there is no more defence against the Philistine. That's a situation that Saul is in and the context of that. But it doesn't take much thought to apply that to our lives. Without God's chosen king, Jesus Christ, the one that David points us to, without him, we are lost. The wages of sin is death. 
we might achieve, as Saul did, a measure of earthly success, but we do not have any eternal success and we are lost. And we might succeed to a point on the earth, but ultimately we have do not have the help of the living God without our trust in his chosen king. So even our earthly successes are bound to dissipate ultimately and we leave behind whatever we've achieved to others and there's but there's no eternal legacy believers leave behind an eternal legacy because they've sown through the gospel in their lives and other lives are being impacted but if we do not know god's chosen king we die and leave this earth and we face loss eternally because we enter the final battle as it were we enter death without God's chosen king and we stand naked before almighty God and in his holiness our sin in all its darkness and filthiness is exposed and we have no option but to be cast from his presence his loving presence into eternal judgment. Saul is in this tragedy of chapter 31, both at an earthly level and a spiritual eternal level because he's rejected God's chosen king. So into this background, we, we, we see the language is part of, of defeat is piled up. If you just go through the first uh, six verses or so, you, you, you see uh, on, on repeat words of defeat. Verse one is, is like the summary of what's to come. The Philistines fought against Israel. The men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And then we have the detail as, as, as the, the story zooms in upon Saul and his sons. But notice the language. Let me just highlight some for you. Verse one, fled and slain. Verse two, struck down. Verse three, thrust me through twice. Verse, sorry, that's verse four. Verse four also fell. Verse five, dead, fell upon, died. Verse six, died. Verse seven, fled, dead, fled. This is a language of defeat on repeat to show how utterly tragic this situation is. The people's king, the people's Messiah cannot save and ultimately loses his own life. The tragic thing is that Saul in his folly leads others into battle who die, including Jonathan, the faithful servant who honoured David and recognised David as the true king. There is one son, ish Bosheth. Bosheth, who is missing from this battle, and he is appointed king by Abner, the head of Saul's army that occurs at the beginning of 2 Samuel. So we have this terrible tragedy. And notice how Saul ends up being abandoned. Israel flees, verse 1, and then verse 2, Philistines overtake Saul the sons are killed and everybody else around him is killed of his choice army and even when you get to uh, verse 7 you see that when the people saw that Saul and his sons were dead they abandoned their cities and fled and the Philistines came and lived in them now that's very interesting because in normal warfare the custom was the king to be protected and if the king dies, the king is removed from the battlefield as quickly as possible so that the king's body is not mistreated, as, as happens here. Israel is so utterly, utterly defeated that they can't even defend their chosen king. In the end, any thing of our own making or desiring that we choose to put our trust in will fail us. And often we then abandon that thing in the hope of some other thing 
Whereas actually we need to abandon that thing and turn to Jesus Christ. And so Saul in the tragedy of his life. And again, there's some very interesting allusions here. So when it says verse 3 that the archers found him. The word found is the word that's used on repeat in 1 Samuel 13 as Saul is seeking to find the sheep and he ends up finding Samuel, but now the archers find him. This is not a random arrow. This is God directing so that Saul is brought down. This is a final judgment, earthy judgment coming upon Saul. We see Saul doing what another false king, another indeed a, a self-appointed king, Abimelech in Judges chapter 9, when a millstone was dropped upon his head, Abimelech asked his armour bearer to slay him. And in that, in that instance, the armour bearer did do that. But he, the armour bearer, perhaps because he's seen that David will not strike the Lord's anointed fears to do such a dreadful thing. So Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. So Saul died and the armour bearer copies him. The tragedy again of the sin of Saul leading to the sin of others. Now, I think it's important at this point for us to distinguish between Suicide as a result of mental illness and suicide in rebellion against God. I know that some would disagree with me that said that all suicide is, is wrong. Well, yes, all suicide is sin. But a person driven to suicide by chemical imbalance in their brain, by trauma in their lives that so affects them, they're, they're so seriously mentally ill they have no hope is not something that we as Christians should stand in condemnation over and certainly while we would not want a true believer to take their own life we have to understand that sometimes we, we, we might say well uh, uh, a believer died of a heart attack or oh, it's such a shame they had an illness in their heart and they died of that what well, if someone has such a severe mental sickness that leads them to take their own life? We could not be standing in condemnation and prejudging their eternal condition. Because even though they've sinned in that final act, if they're a true believer, they are saved. I want to make that very, very clear. What Saul is doing here is not as a result of mental illness, it's as a result of of rebellion against God. He takes what he sees the only way out. Even here, he had opportunity to repent. He saw he was dying. There's no calling out to God for mercy. There's trying to get someone else to kill him and therefore sin. And then he sins by taking his own life as that final act of rebellion against God. I'm going to ask you in a minute how will, actually I'll ask you that now. How will you die? Maybe some will take their own life. But please don't. If you're mentally ill, seek help. Seek counsel. Talk to someone. Go and be with people, even though you don't want to. Get help with your mental illness. There's medical help available. There's spiritual help through prayer and counselling and people standing with you and loving you as a child of God. Get help. If you're in rebellion against God, repent. Don't take your life. Don't carry on. And so you get to your deathbed dying, as it were, from natural causes and are saying, I still don't believe. Call upon the Lord now. Because every death outside of Christ is a tragedy. You may not die in such a desperate state as Saul, but if you die outside of Christ, 
your eternal state is the same as his, lost and under the righteous wrath of God forever. At any time in his life, Saul could have repented, but he refused even to the end. You're listening to this video today because God is giving you another opportunity to hear the gospel, to hear there's a way back to him from the dark path of sin. Jesus calls you to repent and to turn to him and to trust him because he died for your sins on the cross and rose from the dead. And if you turn to him, you'll be forgiven. You will know him and you will die with the assurance, not of eternal death, but of life and glory in all its fullness. Let's learn from Saul's tragic end. And it does not need to be like that for any of you watching this video today. But I said at the beginning that this is a chapter which also shows us God's sovereignty. What happens in these verses is a fulfilment of what Samuel says in 1 Samuel 28 and verse 18. 18 and 19, sorry. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce, fierce wrath against Amalek, Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow, that is today in 1 Samuel 31. Tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel also to the hand of the Philistines. God is fulfilling his word. God is fulfilling his word to Hannah that he spoke through Hannah back in 1 Samuel chapter 2. I want to look there as well. Let me just pick up a couple of verses from 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 4 for example. The bow of the mighty are broken but the feeble bind on strength. 1 Samuel 2 6 the Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes, the, makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. Verse 10, the adversity of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the end of the earth. He will give strength to his king. That is a true king, David, and exalt the horn of his anointed. Just exactly as God has said in his word, this is what happens. God keeps his promises. And we often think, well, God keeps his good promises, like I'll never need, leave you or forsake you. I will meet all your needs according to uh, my riches in glory in Christ Jesus. We quote promises like that. The Lord's my shepherd. I shall not want. We declare those things. We stand on those things. But we need to remember that God keeps his promises of acting in righteous justice in the world. And he's keeping that promise now to Saul. That again is very sobering. We rejoice in the good promises. And from the fact that God keeps the hard promises is an encouragement that he keeps the, the good promises. But it's a reminder too of the urgency, the tasks that we have as believers on earth to warn people because God will keep his promise of Christ's return and the final judgment. And so we have an urgent task before us, before us. But again, this evidence that God fulfills his promises is proof of his sovereignty. And we see this shown explicitly for us in 1 Chronicles chapter 10, where this chapter is, is repeated, but not, not word for word, but uh, it, it's many of the details are the same and some extra details are added. And it's interesting when you get to 1 Chronicles 10, 14, it says this, He did not seek guidance, that is Saul, did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. Now, this is telling us, you say, well, hang on, Saul killed himself. Yes, Saul did. And Saul exercised his free choice 
But even in the exercise of Saul's free choice, God is at work. God did not make Saul kill himself, but Saul's death fulfills God's purposes. Nothing is outside of his sovereign plan, even the bad things. Now, you might say, well, what about my own friend's suicide? What about my own friend's death? What about my child's death? What about my husband or wife's death? We're not told why God does everything. Job was not told why God did what he did, why he gave permission for the devil to go so far but no further. But nonetheless, the, 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 the distance the devil went was terrible and tragic for Job. And is the, the, the sovereignty of God a, a comfort? Yes, it is. Because while we don't know, while Job did not know the reasoning, we know the reasoning. And we also know that in, even in Job's life, God worked all things together for good. God for, for Job and Job being prospered in his latter days, for Job's t testimony to God's goodness, for God's revelation to Job, so Job knew God more, for God's work so that Job could pray for Job's friends who were bad comforters, false comforters, who had a correct theology but wrong interpretation. God worked. In the greatest tragedy of all, God worked in the death of his son. And so, we're not always told why. But we know that God is at work. He's at work in the greatest tragedies of all. That's the first thing. That's the first thing. God fulfills his word because he's a sovereign Lord. Now that's the, the longest point, but let's just continue through the passage and the time we have remaining. Secondly, God allows himself to be dishonoured. So the people flee. Verse 7, Philistines take over the cities. The northern kingdoms from Galilee, around the Sea of Galilee upwards are cut off. Judah and Benjamin and Simeon below are cut off from the north. They have the whole of this middle part of the country, even across the Jordan. It's a tragedy. And then they find Saul. They cut off his head. And 1 Chronicles 10.10 10 tells us, that Saul's head is placed in the temple of Dagon. And if you remember Dagon in 1 Samuel 5 and verse 4 lost his head. His statue lost its head because it fell prostrate before the Ark of the Covenant when the Ark of the Covenant had been captured by the Philistines. So God is allowing himself to be dishonoured by his anointed king his head being in the temple of Dagon. The other gods, this god Ashtaroth mentioned in verse 10. The other idols are good news. They're stripping off the army. His body being fastened to the wall of Bethshan. You see shame upon the Lord's anointed Saul and upon the God of Israel, Yahweh. But God, to fulfill his sovereign purposes, allows his anointed and to an extent himself to be dishonoured. The Philistines are giving glory to their gods and saying their gods are greater than Yahweh. What is God doing? Why is God allowing himself to be dishonoured? Only this morning I was reading in, in Psalm 89. Psalm 89 ends the, the, um, the third book of the, of the book of Psalms. And Psalm 89 talks at length about David and the promise to David that you see in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And how that promise has fallen apart, it seems, because now there is no king. 
And in Psalm 89, 50, it says, Remember, O Lord, how your servants are mocked, how I bear in my heart the insults of many nations with which your enemies mock, O Lord, with which they mock the footsteps of your anointed. That's the situation that's happening here. And again, we see this in the cross. Isaiah 53 shows the Lord's servant being made nothing. And yet Isaiah 53, 10 says it's the Lord's will to crush him and to make him an offering for sin. So God, through the cross, allows his anointed to be dishonoured, allows his own name to be mocked as his own son is slain upon the cross. But he does that for his ultimate glory and the salvation of his people. And here he's allowing himself to be dishonoured. And so that the way is made for his chosen king, his king, the man after his own heart to ascend to the throne. Even the so-called failures of God today are part of his plan to save a people for himself. Even the seeming failures of God to answer your prayers and to fulfill his promises in your life are part of his plan for your good and for his glory. God does allow his name to be dishonoured for a season, but ultimately he and Christ and every believer will be vindicated on that final day. So God fulfills his word, his plan, he fulfills his plan. But even in fulfilling his plan, God allows himself to be dishonoured. But even in the midst of all of these things, even in the depths of tragedy, we see he's still the God of grace. We see these people of Jabesh Gilead. We meet them in 1 Samuel 11. And you find there, if you go and read that, that Saul rescued Jabesh Gilead from the enemies, the Ammonites, and he brought about a mighty victory. And so it's these people who are just across the Jordan, about 20 mile round trip to go to Bethshan, which is on the west of the Jordan, and back to Jabesh Gilead, across enemy country. They go and remove the bodies, they burn them, not in normal Israelite custom, but burn them because they've been so mutilated, uh, and then they bury the bones and mourn for them. A shameful end becomes an honourable end. This is a small glimmer in the, of light in the darkness of this closing chapter. It reminds us that our lives do have consequences. For all the mess, Saul did leave something good behind, a rescued city. Now, how does that apply to us? Well, I believe it applies depending on whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. And in fact, what I'm going to say now in conclusion applies if you're a believer or an unbeliever, but differently. If you're an unbeliever, like 1 Samuel leads us to believe, while good deeds can bring earthly honour, good deeds do not bring eternal life. They do not save you. Saul did some good things, but he was an unbeliever. His heart was in rebellion against God and he chose his own way. So I need to urge you, if you're not a believer, don't rest on your good deeds because they cannot save you. Repent of your sin and pray to the true King, Jesus Christ, to forgive you your sin because he, he, he can and he will because he died for you on the cross and submit to him as your king. Saul never submitted to his, the true king, David. As I said at the beginning, if David was here, this would have been a very different battle. But David was rejected. 
as you enter into eternity, make sure you know the true King. But for believers, it tells us that our good deeds done out flowing from our salvation are seen and known by God. That beautiful verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 58 is that we don't to go weary in doing what is good because we know that our labour is not in vain in the Lord. Let's keep working because God sees all of Israel had fled from Saul, leaving his body there, but Jabesh remembered. And just as the people of Jabesh remembered, so the Lord remembers. Remembers your work. Your labour is not in vain. That's the first thing. Repent if you're an unbeliever because your good deeds cannot save you. If you are a believer, you still need to repent of your sin. Your good deeds don't save you, but your good deeds are remembered by the Lord. That's a comfort and encouragement. He sees all things. The second thing is to ask you what you've done with your life. In 1 Samuel 9, 16, God said to Samuel that, Saul would be the means of delivering from the Philistines. That was God's call upon Saul's life, but Saul failed. Now Saul failed as an unbeliever, but as believers, if you're a believer, I want to challenge you. Make the most of the time that God's given you. I've just said your labor's not in vain in the Lord, well, that means we need to labour in the Lord and not just simply drift through life aimlessly, wasting our lives, wasting the potential God's invested in us. In fact, every, every person is given natural gifts from God. Believers are given spiritual gifts from God in addition to natural gifts. There's often overlap between the two. So, uh, unbeliever, don't waste your life by trying to live your life outside of Christ. But believers, don't waste your life by being in Christ, but not doing anything with that life he's given you. And then finally, to go back to where we started. When the worst happens, when people say it might never happen, and it does, God is still at work and he's working out his purposes. It's not the end of the story. Because one Samuel paves the way for two Samuel and in two Samuel, God is bringing glory out of trouble. And that is the story of scripture because in to Samuel, God's chosen king come to the throne out of the ashes of the failure of the people's king. But in the Gospels, the true king of kings and lord of lords came when the time had fully come. He came when great empires like Egypt and Assyria and Babylon and Persia had come and gone. He came when Greece had gone with its so-called philosophies and, and hero gods. He came after Israel had spent many centuries trying to serve the true God and still find their hearts are sinful and they continually fall short and go their own way. So Jesus comes when human effort in all its forms had failed. He comes to the, as a savior of the word the world to deal with our sin, to defeat death and the devil. He now ever leads to intercede for his own. He sent his spirit to breathe life into our dead souls. He forgives sin. He gives new life. He protects and guides and brings home his people. Everyone who's turned aside from their own human efforts and turned to the true king. 
So again, unbeliever, if you don't know Jesus, you know there's a phrase that goes around today, mainly by uh, those who accuse Christians of being bigoted and um, they say, for sake of argument, homophobic and other such things, we're too narrow, it could only be this one way to God. And people use a phrase, don't be on the wrong side of history. Well, let me give you a verse from Revelation 11 and verse 15. It says this, Revelation 11, 15. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Don't be on the wrong side of history because Christ is the true king and now for believers and I'll close God is sovereign where you are right now is not the end of the story through tragedy disappointment disaster and even death he is working, working in you, through you, around you, in the church, for you, for his glory and for the extension of his kingdom. He's building his church. He's preparing the way for his true king to return. Remind yourself of this. Often when trouble comes, we fall in despair and we need to exercise authority over our despair not pretending it's not there because it's real but speaking the truth to our own hearts and minds again reminding ourselves this is not the end god hasn't finished yet Remember God's kindness at the end of chapter 31 to Saul through Jabesh Gilead. Remember, 1 Samuel becomes 2 Samuel. Remember that God is building his kingdom and the Philistines and ungodly kings cannot stop him. The devil cannot stop him. His, he never fails and his promises never fail. And into your own situation, remind yourself he is greater than this situation. He is more wise than me. He is more powerful than the enemy. And I can trust him even with the worst. Receive this truth into your heart and mind and be at peace. May the Lord help you to keep your eyes on him. And may he build his kingdom in our day and for his glory. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this passage that your word tells us about, yes, great and joyful things, but also the reality of human failure and sin. Our Father, we pray that you would help anybody watching this video to turn to you and be saved if they're not saved already. And those who are your people to trust you. God who's working all things together for good to those who love him and we ask these things in Christ's name amen amen the Lord bless you thank you for listening and for persevering through this series in one Samuel I know we picked up not not right from the beginning I did a review of the beginning because we looked at one Samuel before the pandemic began but we've been, we've finished now. May the Lord bless you and encourage you through the, this series and build you up to keep your eyes wholly upon him. Thank you for listening. God bless you in abundance.